is also known as explosive strength and, and is the, uh, the rate of rise in force or the slope of the torque time curve. And it's distinct from maximal strength um, and, and is um, determined by both peripheral and neural factors and needs to be trained differently than maximal strength. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. In addition to rate of force development, knee, knee joint stabilization may also be affected by the delay in time between the onset of electrical activity and the onset of torque. And this delay is known as electromechanical delay and is influenced by electrochemical processes, which happen prior to the onset of vascular motion. And then the time it takes to transmit the force which is influenced by the stretching of the series elastic component. And if the, uh, the onset or if the electromechanical delay of the hamstrings is greater than that of the quadriceps, then that decreases the fraction of hamstring as the quadriceps torque in the first 50 milliseconds of a rapid muscle action, which may increase the susceptibility to anterior tibial translation and ACL injury. What we see in the literature is that even two year, beyond two years post-surgery, that there are increases in electromechanical delay in the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris um, in the reconstructed limb. And this has been attributed to increases in the time uh, of the stretching of the series elastic components of muscle. However, studies that have looked at, at uh, electromechanical delay have only looked at 30 degrees of knee flexion. And so we're not sure whether um, the electromechanical delay joint angle relationship has been affected um, and whether electromechanical delay is increased at large knee flexion joint angles, such as uh, maximal torque is. Despite these comorbidities, athletes usually return to competition and do so usually within seven to nine months. However, the re-injury rate in competitive athletes is high and it's particularly high in the first two years following uh, surgery. Further, recent large cohort studies have found that the, the odds of graft rupture uh, is higher with hamstring autographs compared to bone patella tendon bone autographs. So we sought to answer the following questions. How does ACL reconstruction using the semitendinosus tendon autograph technique affect rate of force development capacity and electromechanical delay of the knee flexors in athletes who have returned to competition? And if there are deficits, are they knee joint angle dependent? And lastly, do changes in hamstring muscle mechanical properties, such as the torque joint angle relationship and the rate of torque development joint angle relationship relate to morphological changes to the muscle tendon unit? We recruited 15 competitive athletes who had semitendinosus tendon autographs and were competing at the collegiate, the provincial, and the national level. And their characteristics can be seen on the table on the right side. We also recruited 15 healthy non-injured controls who were matched by sex, sport, and performance level. To be included, athletes had to have sustained an isolated unilateral ACL injury, have been clear to compete without restriction, and be between 12 to 36 months post-op. We placed bipolar surface electrodes on the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris of these athletes, and then had them com uh, complete three two-second isometric maximal voluntary contractions at 30, 50, 70, 90, and 105 degrees of knee flexion. They were instructed to contract as fast and hard as they could. And this is an example of what one of the contractions looked like. Hopefully the video works for you guys. We provided subjects with 20 seconds of rest between reps and two minutes of rest between joint angles. Then we had an ultrasound technician take ultrasound measurements on a separate day. And what she did was she measured the distance between the knee crease and the ischial tuberosity and placed marks at 25, 50, and 75% uh, of that distance. Then used the technique called extended field of view in which uh, the ultrasound probe is moved transversely along the muscle and collects a panorama image to be able to view all of the hamstring muscles. The muscles were then uh, outlined and the cross-sectional areas were recorded. 
For our analysis, we took a 100 millisecond average around the maximum torque and maximum rate of torque development value to obtain our peak torque and peak rate of torque development. The onset of the EMG signal was defined as a plus or minus 15 microvolt deviation from the baseline. And for the torque, it was defined as a 3.6 Newton meter deviation above the baseline. And that was based on um, what, what's been used in, in previous uh, studies. We calculated EMD as the time interval between the onset of the EMG signal and the onset of torque. For our analysis, we used linear mixed effects models, which were fit with fixed effects for angle and limb status, as well as the interaction between the two. And we included random intercepts for athlete with limb nested in athlete to account for the repeated measurements at each angle. For our electromechanical delay analysis, muscle was a fixed effect, a fixed effect and for a cross-sectional area, anatomical location and limb status were our fixed effects. So this is what we saw. For knee flexion peak torque, we have torque uh, on our y-axis here, joint angle on the x-axis, and on the left side of the figure are the control athletes, and on the right side of the figure are the ACL reconstructed athletes. And we saw there was a main effect for limb status and the reconstructed limb had lower peak torque at all knee joint angles compared to the contralateral limb. For knee flexion peak rate of torque development, we saw that there was an interaction effect between limb status and joint angle, and the reconstructed limb had a lower peak rate of torque development compared to the contralateral limb at 70, 90, and 105 degrees of knee flexion, and was also lower than the control athletes at 90 degrees. This is what we saw from the ultrasound measurements. So on our y-axis here, we have semi-tendinosis cross-sectional area. And then on the x-axis, we have the, the anatomical measurement site. So the 25%, which is the most distal, and 75, which would be the most proximal measurement. For the control athletes, we saw no difference between limbs. For the reconstructed athlete, um, the reconstructed limb had a smaller cross-sectional area at all measurement sites. And at the 50% measurement site was smaller than the control athletes as well. This is an example of an extended field of view ultrasound image at the 50% anatomical location or measurement site. And this happens to be one of two interesting cases where uh, in the reconstructed limb of this athlete, there was no semitendinosis muscle visible. Uh, and, and that indicates a severe proximal retraction of the muscle. For the other hamstrings, mu hamstring muscles, what we saw was for the biceps femoris, there was no difference between limbs for both the control athletes and the reconstructed athletes. And then for the semimembranosis, there was also no difference between limbs. One of our questions was to determine whether there was a relationship between our torque variables and our cross-sectional area variables. And this is an example of the relationship between the peak torque at 70 degrees and semitendinosis cross-sectional area at the 25% mark. And we had lots of torque variables and lots of cross-sectional area variables, and we decided to summarize it in a correlation matrix. And in this matrix, you'll see on the left-hand side, the cross-sectional area variables. And then on the bottom, you'll see the torque variables, the torque at the different joint angles and the rate of torque at the different joint angles. And what we found was that there were strong relationships between all torque variables and the cross-sectional area at the most distal measurement site. For the contralateral limb, the correlations range from zero to seven uh, and suggested that the torque variables uh, depended less on, on the cross-sectional area variables. Lastly, um, for electromechanical delay, uh, in this figure we have electromechanical delay in milliseconds on our y-axis and joint angle on our x-axis. 
semitendinosus on this side and biceps femoris on this side. And what we found was that there was no difference in limb status um, for the semitendinosus. However, for the biceps femoris, the reconstructed limb had a longer electromechanical delay compared to the contralateral limb. And there was also uh, no effect of joint angle on electromechanical delay. To summarize our results, we saw persistent deficits in knee flexion maximal torque in ACL reconstructed athletes with this semitendinosus tendinotograph surgery, despite unrestricted return to competition at one to three years post-surgery. And the rate of torque development joint angle relationship was altered with more pronounced deficits at large knee flexion angle. We saw strong relationships between hamstring muscle cross-sectional area and knee flexor maximal torque and rate of torque development in the reconstructed limb. And the electromechanical delay joint angle relationship was unaffected, but there was a difference in the electromechanical delay of the biceps femoris in the reconstructed limb. In summary, we've seen that the, uh, this surgical procedure causes secondary comorbidities, which may change the ACL injury risk profile for an athlete. And we can think of an athlete's risk for ACL injury as a profile um, with, uh, that includes com complex interactions between risk factors where no one risk factor warrants an injury, but the interaction between them may. And it's a practitioner's job to be able to identify which, which risk factors are modifiable and trainable and be able to come up with a program to be able to reduce the deficits in these risk factors. The next logical question that you might ask is, can we actually restore structure and function in this hamstring muscle where the tendon was cut out? And right now we don't know the, the answer. There are no uh, studies evaluating the effectiveness of training interventions on restoring hamstring neuromuscular properties following the surgical procedure. However, what we do know is that in healthy subjects, the semitendinosus can be targeted in training through specific exercise selection. Uh, and in a few studies done by Bourne et al., we see that knee flexion dominant exercise exercises such as the Nordic hamstring or the leg curl result in higher degrees of uh, medial hamstring activation or semitendinosus muscle activation compared to biceps femoris. And in a training study, uh, the Nordic hamstring exercise led to larger increases in muscle volume compared to a hip dominant exercise. Here we see change in volume and then semitendinosus. Um, muscle and in a larger change in volume with the Nordic hamstring compared to a hip, hip dominant exercise. So as a, as a practitioner, how do you go about solving the problem of having to increase hamstring muscle size, strength, and rate of force development? I think it's first important to have a basic understanding of the training factors or variables that mediate the increases in those qualities. For muscle hypertrophy, uh, resistance training increases in, in muscle hypertrophy are primarily mediated by intensity of effort, which can be mod modulated by load, by training frequency, interset rest, time under tension, blood flow occ uh, occlusion, and mode of contraction, but uh, as long as you are going to volitional uh, fatigue, the load that you use doesn't really matter. It seems that you can get similar adaptations between lower loads and higher loads as long as you go to fatigue. And I'm not sure if you can see the video if the, or if the video is working for you guys, but this is an example of a, a standing hamstring curl exercise where this athlete is, is just instructed to go until he can't go anymore. In contrast, uh, increases in maximal muscle strength are primarily mediated by load and are optimized by, at loads that are greater than 80% uh, of an athlete's one repetition max. 
And this is an example of uh, a Nordic hamstring curl where the eccentric portion is overloaded to try and increase her maximal muscle strength. Increases in rate of force development are primarily mediated by movement velocity, however. And actually, a recent meta-analysis done by Blazevich has found that you can actually get increases in rate of force development if you are moving slow, as long as your intention during the exercise is to move as fast as you can. And this is an example of uh, a single leg hamstring curl exercise where the intention is to uh, move as fast as you can on the concentric and the eccentric portion of the movement. At the Sport Institute, we have many athletes that, um, that have had this type of surgery uh, and, and are, going through, um, uh, are going through our training program. And I wanted to share a few case studies because each athlete is different um, and go through some of the different timelines um, and recoveries of these athletes. So this is an example of uh, a national alpine ski racer. And we're looking right now at hamstring maximal muscle strength. And we see maximal torque here and then dates on the x-axis. And these tests were done at 70 degrees of knee flexion. And what we see is that when she initially tested after her surgery, that there was a large difference between the reconstructed limb and the contralateral limb at these time points. But we do see her able to recover some of this strength, but it took quite a bit of time. This is 18 months post-op at this point here. Now looking at her rate of force development, we see increases, this is the reconstructed limb on the right side, increases in rate of force development as well. But again, that takes quite a bit of time for her to be able to recover it. And still there's quite a bit of difference between the reconstructed limb and the contralateral limb. This is an example of a, a provincial level skier who came to our program uh, two years after her, her surgery. And you can see when she came in and she was first tested, the discrepancy in size. Uh, and the, in maximal strength from the reconstructed side to the contralateral side. But she's actually able to recover some of that. And now she's about 36 months post-op, um, but she was actually able to increase maximal strength. And then we see the same thing with rate of force development, but there's still discrepancy between sides. This is the last athlete that I wanted to show. And this is a, a national level ski cross athlete. And you can see when she first tested, again, the discrepancy between sides and how long it took her to recover her strength. But right now, she just tested, she's 30 months post-op, and now we see some symmetry between limbs. And then similar with her rate of force development. And the reason I wanted to show that was because uh, it, it illustrates that each athlete really is different and that the recovery of these mechanical properties are, uh, take quite a bit of time and longer than you might expect. Unfortunately, we, we weren't able to collect any um, ultrasound data on these athletes, so we don't know if there were actual changes in the semitendinosus muscle or whether these athletes have been able to regenerate a tendon, but that's potentially a future direction and something that we might start to collect. In summary, we see that surgical repair using the semitendinosus tendon causes secondary comorbidities that may reduce knee joint stabilization capacity. And as a practitioner, being able to identify trainable deficits in maximal strength, rate of force development, electromechanical delay, and muscle size is important to be able to guide the rehabilitation process and ensure a safer return to sport. Assessing knee flexor strength and rate of force development across the full knee joint range of motion uh, is important. And addressing semitendinosus muscle hypertrophy may be important to restore knee flexor function after this surgical procedure. And lastly, autograph choice should be made with consideration for the athlete's functional requirements, such as the specific strength that they need in their sport.
Thanks. Thank you, Nate, uh, for the great talk. So whoever has any questions to Nate, uh, please click the raise hand button or just shake um, your hand in front of your camera so that I can catch you. Would anyone have any questions to Nate? Actually, I have a question for you. Um, so one of most of the, um, your variables, Nate, uh, in your study was using ultrasound uh, image. Um, I'm wondering, because sometimes I feel measuring the image through the ultrasound machine, that's somehow tricky. So would there be any reliable tests that you did or like it just quantify like how reliable the image is? Yeah, you're right. It it is quite tricky using sound. Um, and at first I was going to be the one doing the imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's actually quite difficult because if you apply a little bit too much pressure, you get a different image. So if you were going to do imaging day after day, mm -hmm. if you're not very skilled and you apply a little bit of different pressure or you go over uh, at a different angle, then you can get a different result. So I was lucky enough to be able to um, seek out a technician who was very skilled and we actually did a reliability study where we had six athletes come in um, one day and then come in the following day at the exact same time um, and we looked at how close her measurements were day to day and she was pretty much um, bang on so uh, we were happy and excited about that so thank you um, I see Brent, do you have any questions to Nate? Yeah, Nate, I had a question about the uh, main results of the study where you showed the ACL reconstructed athletes versus their contralateral limb. And then the other plot you had the control athletes. And it looked to me like even though there was no difference between left and right for the, in terms of strength for the control athletes, and there was large differences for the uh, ACL reconstruction group. It almost looked like the healthy leg of the ACL reconstruction group were even stronger than that of the control group. Uh, was that just me interpreting that plot wrong or um, did you see that in the statistical analysis? We didn't see that in the statistical analysis, um, but I, you are right, it kind of looks that way, and I think they were, uh, it wasn't statistical, but I think they were a bit stronger, and that might have had to do with just the way that we recruited our athletes, and the, the athletes who were actually injured that we recruited were, um, uh, were actually quite strong on, on their contralateral limbs and that the control athletes may not have been at the level of the, the athletes who were injured. And so that's kind of something that I, I, we noticed as well in our data, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, Walter, please go ahead. Sure, I have a, have a bunch of questions, but I'm just gonna ask one or two and give people a little bit time to think about their questions. But uh, I, almost, almost as a follow-up, um, just a generic question, how valid do you think it is to compare the contralateral limb with the injured limb? Because at the beginning you started out and said, uh, you know, the normal contralateral limb, is the contralateral limb indeed normal? Or how, how do you view that? That's, yeah, it's a, it's a very good point you make, and that's um, the figure that you, you, you referenced is from a different study where it says percentage of normal limb, and I, that's probably not the best way to view it because um, there are studies that show that the contralateral limb strength is affected as well, and so it's probably not best to compare the injured limb to the contralateral limb, but to compare to somebody who's of uh, similar strength or to compare to data pre-injury, um, because yes, the, the, the contralateral limb would have been as well. 
and maybe I ask quickly a second question and then I'm going to be quiet for a while. But the, the rate of force development, um, I've, I've always found that a, a somewhat uh, interesting variable to measure because, you know, when I ski downhill or when I see the racers uh, or in training, you know, they are in a flexed squat type of a position and the muscles are activated presumably to a great extent already. And when you measure the force, the rate of force development, you know, you measure it going from zero force and then you activate to maximum force. And my question is, how relevant do you think that is compared to the idea that these muscles are already activated? They are already very stiff. And, you know, and in the racing, they receive these bumps continuously and, you know, and the, the muscles are vibrating and have to dampen the shocks you know, 10 times a second or so in a downhill race. So do you think, uh, do you think uh, rate of force development is indeed um, a valuable measure? And if so, why? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a, a totally a good point as well. Right? And, uh... Nate? <clears throat> really relaxed to... Um, um, sorry, Nate. I think could you, you lose just me go... for a second? Yeah, yeah. Could you just go okay. over? Please? Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. I was saying that you're correct, Walter. It's, it's the way that we measure rate of torque development like that is not relevant to uh, to sport. So it's uh, totally not relevant to a situation a situation like skiing where they're going to have a high degree of pre-activation. Um, while they're, they're going down the hill. But we wanted to be able to measure this ability because it is a distinct ability from, from um, maximal strength. And we wanted to be able to do it in a way that was um, uh, standardized and, and repeatable. And so our, uh, the way we chose to do that was to go from a fully relaxed position and then see how fast these athletes can produce force. And there's probably a different way where we can try and measure rate of force development in a situation where an athlete already has some level of pre-activation, whether that's in, a, in a, uh, an isometric squat or uh, a leg press where isometric leg press where they have some level of pre-activation or even in the way that we did it um, with the isometric hamstring curl where they have to be activated to a certain degree, but that would probably change um, the, the repeatability of the test. And all we were trying to do is see if we could measure this distinct ability so that um, if we can track it over time, then hopefully it's something that we can change and that it's meaningful. Good, thanks. I think Benno has a question there or somebody else. Uh, yeah, I saw Art as well. So please, Art, go ahead first. I have a question about um, the proximal retraction that you talked about for the muscle. And I'm just curious uh, what the muscle looks like. Uh, so when it retracts like that, is it, uh, uh, are the fascicles shortening or is the pination angle changing or, you know, wh what's happening to the, the muscle itself? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. We didn't, we didn't look at that. We didn't look at um, pination angle or um, fascicle length. And we, this was something that we were going to try to look like, uh, look at at the beginning of the study. Um, but the pination angles for the semitendinosus are pretty much. Some there's really it's just a a a, a parallel. Uh, the, the fascicles run parallel. So in some, in, in a couple studies that have looked at this, they've saw, seen that the, the semitendinosus um, is a little bit thicker proximally because of the retraction, but I'm not really sure. They haven't looked at uh, pination angles or anything like that either. Um, okay, so presumably it's the fascicles are just getting shorter, like they have a shorter... I, I yeah, I, I think that's yeah. what would happen. They would just be shorter, yeah. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, I thought I saw um, Dave, you raised your hand earlier. Yes, uh, thanks. I had a quick question. Um, I may have missed it, but are there any um, differences between males and females in their pattern of responses? Unfortunately, we weren't we weren't able to control for for sex, so we don't know. Uh, and the majority of our subjects were were female. Um, yeah, but the, that, no, that's a good question. I don't I don't I don't know. Yeah. A quick follow up. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I asked is if I understand correctly from some of uh, Carolyn Emery's work, uh, some adolescent athletes, anyway, females particular have uh, imbalances between quad and hamstring uh, muscle strength to start with. Uh, Sorry, uh, Dave, I just missed the end, end of your question there. Were you saying that there was differences to begin with in, in females with their, their the strength of their quadriceps and their hamstrings? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, the way I understand it is that uh, some of the neuromuscular training programs that uh, Carolyn implements uh, in, in these young athletes uh, are designed to uh, overcome some of that imbalance already. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's fair and that, that, that's true. That, um, uh, as I mentioned, that the, the, the quadricep hamstring ratio has, has, has been seen as a, a, a risk factor. And, and at, in a couple of studies, it seems that uh, females have a, a lower ham to quad ratio, uh, just naturally. Sure, yeah. Thanks. I see Benno, you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. The question that I have relates to the re-injury. When these people re-injure, could they avoid that re-injury by applying a force quickly in a situation? Or are these re-injuries, injuries that are completely outside the range of that can be controlled with the muscles. I mean, if you look at a typical ski injury, uh, I think you cannot control that with muscle strength. I, I think it, it, there's a combination. I think it depends. I think you're right. In, in some skiing situations, uh, the, the energy and the impact is too great for your your muscle to be able to protect the joint, for sure. Um, and I think in some so the, situation, the, sorry, go ahead. The question is then whether you measure the right variable, whether this variable that you measure is really something that is important in this content or whether it's something else. Have you thought about that? I, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a it's a good point. But I do think that in some situations, um, having the uh, the strength and the ability to protect the knee joint through rapid muscle action uh, probably can provide some safety. And whether it's even in in alpine skiing, just landing from a, a normal jump, which we see. Uh, ACL injuries happen rather than a crash or in a sporting situation like landing from a, a jump in soccer or basketball in those cases where they aren't very strong and they don't have um, kind of that that safety net the ability to dissipate uh, some of the energy so yeah there's maybe some things that we we uh, need to consider as uh, as other uh, risk factors, but for sure we think that, uh, yeah, strength and rate of force development should be considered, yeah. And why? If, it, if, it, if you cannot do it with force, if you cannot avoid the injury with, with your application of a force at the right time? Well, I think that you can. In, in some cases, and in some cases you can't. I, I don't think, I don't think you can. 
I, I think, you know, the, the problem is much more not to get in these situations. The ones you are in that situation that is ex extreme, you, you cannot do anything, I think. So I... I so you I think... Really... It's... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I think it is something else, you know, I don't know what, but I think it's, it's something else that allows you to control that you don't get into these situations where you have an injury afterwards. That's fair. Like, uh, are you are you talking about the uh, an athlete's comp movement competency? So how well they move, like their uh, ability to put themselves in situations or positions that aren't very, um, I guess, uh, where that don't load their knee joint as much, where their uh, contact outside their center of mass or something like that. Is that what you're referring to? Something like that. I don't know what. Can I, can I, can I jump into this conversation here? This, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. One, one thing that I thought about was though, that the greatest risk for an ACL injury is having an ACL injury already. And so either we can think, you know, for me, I'm thinking Occam's razor that, you know, you have a weak muscle from surgery, which puts you at an increased risk for having ACL injury. Otherwise you have to make some other type of leap of faith and say that the reason that they have an increased risk of ACL injury is because they, there's something about their behavior that puts them more, more so than other individuals that puts them at an increased risk because uh, they just get more into these situations. They're just more likely to get put into a situation that causes an ACL injury. And I have a harder time believing that than, than, than the first argument, which would be that you have a reduction in strength uh, or rate of deforce of development or whatever because of the surgery and the injury. And as a consequence, you have an increased risk uh, of injury. So that's how I rationalize that in my head. Can I, can I jump in as well? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we know that, you know, whenever we test skiers, they are incredibly strong. If you are not strong in your knee extensor, leg extensor muscles, you are not going to be an Olympic skier. It seems to be a given. There needs to be a certain amount of strength, and and I th and and I think Matt showed that very nicely in some of his studies and literature review that these um, injuries, these ACL injuries, tend to occur much more in the latter third of a race than at the beginning, and therefore it might be fatigue. And if you're stronger, and we measure strengths, or Nate measures strengths, if you're stronger, then maybe you're less fatigued when you get towards the end of the race, and you have more reserves, and therefore you might not get as much into these situations. So it might be as simple as that, that if you have a better reserve and more strengths relative to whatever, then um, and you're not as fatigued, that maybe then uh, you are better able to uh, avoid these situations, because I... I agree with Beno, <laughs> you know, if you ski normally and are under control, nobody tears an ACL by being perfectly under control in skiing. It, it, it is always a free key thing when something abnormal happens and you catch an edge or something like that. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's the fatigue and the stronger you are, maybe the better you are protected. Maybe the better, the higher rate of force development you have, the smoother you can react to little perturbations on top of the on top of the hill and don't get quite as tired. Maybe if you have good technique, you don't get as tired as when you have worse technique and therefore the worse technical skiers get more into these situations. I agree with that 100%. I just think that yeah. now we're sort of arguing semantics of whether or not it's the strength that gets you into a situation that causes the ACL injury, or if it's having the strength. Yeah, I'll just, maybe I'll- I guess I'll, I see the difference there, actually. 
I, I guess I see that. And I think, I think part might be strengths because, uh, you know, uh, growing up in Switzerland where everything stops when there is downhill races, you know, exams get delayed at the ETH. <laughs> at, you know, the right. university delays exams because there's a downhill race over lunchtime, you know, it happens to us uh, because you wanna, oh, everybody watches the race. Um, some people get into really, really crazy situations. You know, you're thinking about some skiers that, that are in the most impossible situations and they get out of it and you go, nobody else or maybe one other skier would have gotten out of that situation without falling and tearing themselves apart. And, and sometimes people, you know, uh, are in an incredible off balance situation and, and, and then a skier can save themselves and, uh, where 19 out of 20 could not. So I think there's a certain element of, of that as well but that might be a smaller element. <laughs> yeah. Um, I see Arch, do you have questions? Sorry, you're muted. No, sorry. sorry, I don't. I just forgot to lower my hand. Yeah, yeah okay. I also see Enquan, you have a question. If you are here, please go ahead. Yes, I'm here. Um, Nate, thanks for the great presentations. I really enjoy the talk. Um, I am interested in the, the, the graft that is used, sorry, the source of the tissue that is used for the graft. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that it depends on the activity that you're doing. Um, and what would you recommend for a different sport? So for example, you are, for the skiing, most of the time people use hamstring tendon. And in what sports would people choose to use a patella tendon? Or, or... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think in in sports where you require the hamstrings quite a bit, so it, in maybe a field sport where that requires high speed running, where the hamstrings are involved quite a bit you may opt to use the patellar tendon instead of the hamstring tendon. Uh, in sports where you have to do a lot of repetitive jumping and repetitive, um, or you're using the, the knee extensors a lot like the quads or in, uh, in alpine ski racing or in basketball, you might opt to use the, the hamstring tendon. So uh, I'd say it's, yeah, it's, it depends on the sport and that's kind of what we've seen or what I've seen um, working with the various sports that the surgeons, um, they'll, they'll change the, the graph that they use depending on the sport, but it also they'll sometimes just use what they've, they're better at. So uh, surgeons like Dr. Hurd, I know he, he prefers using the semitendinosus tendon because he's really good at it. And he might just use it with most of the athletes um, if he doesn't think that using it will be a problem. Just curious about the surgical technique, but I'm not sure if you are uh, um, uh, familiar with that. So for the semitendinosus tendon, um, the surgeon has to resect, resect the tendon completely, right? And then shave off a part of the tendon and then suture the tendon back. So for the patella tendon, do you also need to do that? Or, or you just shave off without resecting the, the tendon at all? Uh, no, so with the semitendinosus uh, tendon autographs, they, they, they take the full tendon. There's no, they don't take part of it. They slide, they slide a little tool up. I should have included a video, it's pretty cool. They slide it, they grab the tendon, they slide a tool up, they sniff it once they get to the muscular tendinous junction and then he pulls it out and that's what that picture was. He pulls it out and then snips it off on the bottom and he's got this big piece of tendon. They usually fold that up four times, insert that back into the knee and that's the new ACL. So they just, they, there's just no more semitendinosus tendon anymore in that, uh, in that athlete there. And then for the patellar tendon, they'll usually, uh, bone patellar tendon bone graft, they usually take the middle third so they'll take um, the middle third of the patella, a chunk of the, or middle third of the patellar tendon, uh, a small chunk of the uh, patella, 
in a small chunk from the tibial tuberosity, and then they'll use that and um, pull that through the knee as, as the, the, the graft. So in that sense, then, then the, if you use the patella tendon as a graft, then you potentially wouldn't change the, the muscle length of a, the quadricep muscles, is it right? Compared to a semitendinosis where you remove the entire tendon and therefore you change the muscle length altogether after the surgery. Yes, yeah, that's correct, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Matt raising his hand, please go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just gonna just gonna maybe chime in a little bit on this, uh, you know, again, following up to the discussion that was happening earlier. But I think I would agree. I think you see, you know, you see a couple of different scenarios. And a few weeks ago, when I did this seminar, the one in September, I showed the one video of our athlete coming down the hill and, and uh, you know, at Lake Louise, she's one of our senior skiers, strong, fit, everything that you would imagine. And she goes into the fence at 120 kilometers an hour and does a helicopter, you know, and we often say, you know, you're not like, this is, this goes to Benno's point. You're not, the reason that happened by all expert accounts was that she was at the razor's edge of her technical abilities. And so, you know, I sort of bin that into one type of an example where the only way you prevent that injury is you would, you would, she would have had to come off her limit in which case she's not going to win a race. So, um, you know, these, these, uh, realities where the, the better they are, the more they take risks, the more they take risks, the, the closer they are to that, to that precipice of an injury is, is a real thing. And then on the other hand, we see an increasing trend and, in, um, you know, uh, we have some data to back this up, but we see an increasing trend that if we compare the fitness of a Canadian skier in this era, so we're talking, let's just say from 2010 to today with the previous era, which is let's say 1999 to 2010 it seems to be the case that on average uh, skiers today are, are less fit than they would have been um, a, a decade a decade ago. And, and consequently what we've seen happen with, with some of our younger skiers is they'll have these injuries that they're not at the technical limit. They're, they're, they're going off a jump um, and they land and, you know, they tear an ACL. And if you watch the video of how, how these injuries occur, uh, what appears to be happening is just they don't have the strength to absorb the energy that's going on in a, in a relatively innocuous jump or turn or what have you. Um, so we do see these examples where, you know, in that category, it would appear that skiers maybe have less, um, less physical prep preparedness for, for the, the high risk environment that they're in. And then the second piece I would just say to, to kind of end, end my thoughts on it is that when you have these in these these injuries, and then you go on to have a, a surgical procedure that's relatively um, relatively aggressive, I would say, and, and relatively uh, you know damaging in a second way to the body because of, of the nature of how they reconstruct the ACL. Um, the reality is is that many of these skater, skiers go back, and the you know the attrition rate is is not great, and that was another thing that we 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 uh, we, we did some work on to look at the fact you know fact that thirty percent of these skiers go on to have another injury. And I guess at the, at the, you know, the strategy there is if you're going back on a, on a hill aggressively, and, and this kind of builds off Brent's point, let's say that you've got one limb that's at a 20% deficit compared to the other. Um, it's, it's a, again, anecdotal evidence, but one of our friends in uh, Sweden has data where they put force sensors underneath the skis. And what seems to be the case is that whereas skiers, when they're healthy, tend to load the outside ski to create pressure, if they've got that asymmetry and they've got that leg that's at a, at a deficit, they end up sitting a little bit more in the middle. So it actually changes how they ski because they don't have the availability at the knee joint in terms of strength capacity. They change the they change the technique. And so, you know, I think that brings more questions out about, you know, whether it's fatigue factors, they've changed how they ski, you know, if there is a high energy event, you know, do they have the, the muscle strength to dissipate that energy? Um, lots of questions, uh, but I thought I would just add my two cents there. Thank you. Um, I have a few more minutes for a couple of questions. Dave, did you just raise your hand? Yes, please go yeah. ahead. Okay. Um, I guess I had a question that I, I understand why you picked uh, isolated ACL injuries to, to be able to do your study without as much uh, of a set of confounders. 
but it was my understanding that uh, isolated ACL injuries are not the largest category and uh, most uh, ACL injuries also lead to meniscal damage or uh, other, other um, joint damage as well. Does that influence the choice of uh, picking which, uh, which reconstruction uh, tendon to use? It may, and, and you know, that, that's a, it's a good point because it made it really hard to, uh, to recruit subjects for this study because, uh, yeah, as Matt pointed out, uh, a lot of these uh, skiers who get injured get re-injured. And so we have quite a bit of athletes in our athlete pool who have had two and some have had three, a couple have had four of these injuries. Um, and then the one, a lot of the ones who do have one, they have an MCL tear, an LTL tear with that, um, tibial plateau fractures, um, loss of associated damage. And so originally I was going to do this study and use only ski racers, um, but it was really hard to find them that had just a single ACL injury. And so that's why I kind of had to open it up and try to include um, other athletes because yeah, you're right. It's like, uh, uh, usually there's other associated damage in these skiers because of the, the nature of the, um, the sport. Yeah. Okay. I see Walter, you have a question. Please go ahead. Sure. I have a couple more questions, actually a follow-up uh, just to a comment that Matt was making when he said, uh, you know, uh, people get very good and they take risks and when they take more risks then they get more into these situations. Has anybody ever looked at the rate of ACL injury in elite alpine skiers and their personality profile? Would it be that people that are more prone to taking risks are actually the ones that get injured? and the somewhat more timid ones might not. So it might all be a matter of personality and not biomechanics. Something to think about. I'm serious, I'm serious. No, I, I, mean, think, I, think there, I think there is, and Matt can probably uh, talk about this, but um, I know that the more elite skiers, the ones who do, who are top 30 in the world, those are the ones who have the uh, highest risk of uh, ACL injury and secondary uh, ACL injury. And that's likely due to them wanting to go really fast and not having any fear. Uh, Matt, you can probably talk more on that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's all it's all speculation, Walter, from my end. But I'll tell you, like, it's it's um, it sure seems to be the case that especially with our speed skiers, they need to have that extra gear, right? And and um, and you know that extra gear is um, what gets them gets them that, you know, hundredth of a second at the end of a race and puts them on a podium. And, and uh, the coaches will often talk about the skiers that don't have that extra gear in terms of pushing their limits. And, um, you know, um, I do think this, the psychological component is a big part of it. And looking back at re-injury, you know, that's another thing that um, in the literature more from field sports is that one of the best predictors for a successful outcome after an ACL reconstruction is your psychological readiness. And uh, certainly seems to be the case that skiers, some skiers who've suffered a big, a big, a big crash and, and have had serious injuries, um, it sure seems like that can be a limiting factor about whether or not they are able to make it back success, successfully. Um, so I, it goes kind of back to the web that Nate showed, right? It's, it's not, it's really hard to isolate these injury events down to, you know, one or two or three predictors. In fact, it's a complex system. So mm -hmm. you, know, you really have to kind of capture that complexity. I think if you're, if you're to do it justice. It might be interesting to just uh, get a little uh, Myers-Briggs or so personality test of all the athletes and then 10 years down the road, see, uh, how that might potentially relate. But anyway, uh, another question that I have is, uh, is there anything known, and you know, you talk about re-establishing strength of the hamstring muscles following that surgical intervention. But um, you know, you also said something that I thought was really interesting that in some people, the tendon kind of comes back and reattaches and in other people it does not. 
is there anything known about how you potentially might promote tendon growth after semi-tendon tendon removal? And is there anything known in that area? Not that I've seen. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen anything. Maybe they can send it my way, but I think that's a very interesting uh, thing to think about. How can we influence um, tendon regeneration through exercise? Um, I think it's really interesting, yeah. And then just a couple of little things. Uh, sorry, Dave, yeah, you were wanting to jump in. I was just going to jump in on that, that uh, uh, sometimes uh, things uh, reappear that look like a tendon perhaps, but really it's scar tissue. Um, so it may look like a tendon, but it, it doesn't function very well as a tendon. Um, so it, it can grow into a deficit uh, mm. due to uh, fibrogenic response. Um, and it looks like a tendon perhaps, or tendon-like, but it's not really that functional. On a completely different uh, level, um, I realized that in your graphs, when you showed the, up, the, the rate of force development, you always showed the absolute values. And, and I wonder if that might be the best way of doing it because, you know, if I have 200 Newton meters that I can do on my good leg and 100 Newton meters on my bad leg, and I do it exactly in the same time, you know, I reach peak force in 250 milliseconds, then you could argue that my rate of force development for the muscle that I have is exactly the same, but it would only be half as fast on the weaker one because, because uh, you have a lower force, you have only half the force. So I was wondering if you normalize that relative to the maximum force, the rate of force development, um, if you then will get a different result. Yeah, we, we did look at that as well and, and we did okay. normalize it. Um, and when we did normalize it, there wasn't, there wasn't a difference. So there okay. was uh, uh, no difference between limbs. Once so the difference was explained. Which, so the difference the... would be strength, yeah. Yeah, okay, now that, it, it almost looked that way and I was wondering about that. And last question that I have, very, very quick one, a very small one. Um, see my tendon gnosis is a two joint muscle. Did you uh, pay any attention to, uh, did, did you keep like the hip it's joint it. angle always the same or uh, do you control for that? When we tested? Yes. Yeah, yes, we um, uh, did, they were always lying prone and we had them strapped down so that they couldn't move through the hips. So mm -hmm. um, hip, hip joint angle was kept the same. We didn't assess hip extensor strength, which it may be interesting as well, but yeah, no, they, okay. yeah. Good, thanks. Yeah, I see Dave, you have a final um, question. Yep. Yeah, I have one final question. Um, is there any data out there that would indicate that it has to be a, um, an autologous uh, tendon? Uh, is there any data indicating that allogeneic uh, semi, uh, the, the hamstring tendon uh, can function uh, as well as uh, autologous? Uh, yeah, I, I just, Literature would suggest it just it doesn't um, function as well, and the the re rupture rates are 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 uh, higher than using autologous. And so I know that's why surgeons like um, Doctor Hurt, who I worked with, he he prefers uh, using the patient's own tendon um, okay. rather than than somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, on that note, I would like to thank Nate again for sharing his work with us. Um, next week, we'll be hearing from Pratham Singh. He will be talking about determining speed and stride length using an ultra-wide bandwidth local positioning system.
I'll see you all next week.